Hey everybody, back again. We're going to start statistics this week, and I'm going to make two videos on this this week. One is a recap of the stuff that we did last year in Nightcats, and the stuff uh, that's kind of new, um, and how we represent it and stuff. So it might be worth your while watching this first video. If you feel comfortable enough, etc, etc, you can watch the next video. There's an awful lot of talk, and there's not going to be tons and tons of examples. Um, just a couple to, to go through, but I'll... I'll I'll try and keep you entertained through the time we've got this. All right, so this is statistics in the data cycle, uh, incorporating foundation and higher, aka math. So data handling. There are four steps to data handling. Uh, we call it the data cycle, if you like, and uh, you can copy this down into your into your notes. Um, the four steps it starts at the start. You would pose yourself a question. If you pose yourself a question, we've got to decide on the data and how to collect it. And once we do that, we organize and analyze the data, and after that, we interpret and draw results. Depending on how we, how results look and how we've interpreted it, we might need to go back to the start again and pose a new question. So change the question slightly so that we get kind of better results. Or if the results come out and they're a little bit ambiguous, um, we might want to go back and define the parameters of our question a bit more. But we're going to go through each of these four stages of the data cycle over the course of the statistics and hopefully they'll make a bit of sense by the time we come to the end of it. Like I said at the top of the video, we've done some of this already last year. In fact, I covered it in pretty good detail last year, but nothing quite like a refresher, is there? Okay, so you can copy that down, pause the video and copy those the data cycle down, or you can lift it from your notes from last year, whichever way it goes. So, how does this work? So if I take you through uh, a slight... Uh, Scenario, should I say, um, about how this should work. So, if we were playing a game that involved rolling a dice, um, I think, or somebody in the group thinks, that a score of six will occur fewer times than it ought to, how could we state a hypothesis to investigate and complete the data cycle to follow that? Okay. So, the first stage of this is obviously to pose the question. And if we, what, what, what's the question going to be? We don't want it to be too vague and we don't want it to be, you know, open to interpretation. And all these are going to have hypotheses spelt wrong, by the way, sorry. What can you do? So I'll change it at each time we go along. So I'm going to say the question is, if I roll the dice 60 times, a 6 will occur less times than it should. 10 using the probabil probability uh, that the chances if I roll the dice 60 times... There's an even chance of each of the six sides of the dice coming up, or sixth. And a sixth of 60 is 10. So you would expect to use normal probability rules that if I roll the dice 60 times, we'll get a, a t 6, 10 times out of that. I've stated the question in such a way that anybody could administer this test. Okay? I could probably say if I, if I roll the dice fairly, might be the only other way I could do it, but I'm assuming people are just rolling the dice just in a random manner. I've defined 60 times, uh, and I've defined the parameters by which I want to measure. So that's the question. So once I've a question done, the next stage to go on and do is decide how I would like to collect the data. And in this case, I'm going to roll a dice 60 times, like I stated in the question, and record the amount of each number that it lands on. So once uh, I've decided how I'm going to collect the data, I've got to decide you know, how we're going to organize our results, how we're going to sort this out. And, you know, it seems, in this case, fairly straightforward that we'll put results into an organized tally chart, such as the one down here. So the number of dice, number on the dice, I'll fill in as a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. And then we will put a tally in. So we could, for instance, um, if I get my pen, as we go along, we might decide that, you know, the first number we roll is a, is a 2. That's 1. Next one we roll is a 1. We roll another 2. We roll a 3, a 4, a 2, a 6, etc, etc. And as we go along, once we get the 5, we do the 5 get. Or the, the 5, uh, as I say, for the tally. So we can count it up in 5s. Once we get the 60, that will be our... Um, results totaled up, and we can then go ahead and um, put in our, our tally, our frequencies here at the end. 
five one I know these don't add up to sixty but whatever they are at the end we can put those in at the end and then hopefully if we've done our thing right we'll get sixty if we get fifty nine we'll know we'll have to roll the, the dice one more time to record the results but we want to end up with sixty so it will satisfy what the question was and that's how we collect and organize our results last part is we're going to interpret our results uh, we could draw a graph to represent that data, for instance, but in this case we probably, you know, we can put it in a bar chart and invest, investigate our results and see whether the 6 did occur ten, less than 10 times. If it encountered 10 times, then it doesn't disprove that theory because the guy says, or the hypothesis stated, that if it occurs 10 times, or sorry, less than 10 times, if it occurs 10 or more, then that hypothesis is not true. You could also state that the hypothesis isn't quite right because, you know, you could test it, you know, less times and get those results swayed. It wouldn't necessarily prove it one way or the other. You could do it across multiple groups, etc., etc. And that's the beauty of statistics. And we'll come back to that later. How do we ensure, if we're doing a test where we're not sure whether the outcome of our result is going to be fair and tr a true reflection, how do we increase the chances of that happening? And we'll come to that when we do sampling and things like that. Okay. So if I move on, I'm going to go into each of these bits in some detail. So I'm going to start off with the question. And pro there's lots of problems that can arise with questioning because questions can be one vague. So we could have va vague question some way as well, the last one would, would would be a good one. Um, something like, you know, I think a six would occur less times than it should if I rolled the dice a number of times. Depending on who administers that, that little experiment, they might roll the dice, dice ten times. They might roll the dice sixty times. They might roll the dice a hundred times. There's nothing to say what it is, what this, the parameters of it are. They also might decide on how often less than it should means. I mean, there's again, there's no parameters for it. Another example would be if I asked a question something like, are young people fit? Or do people who smoke die young? Those things, words like young and fit, are subjective. Um, so, depending on who the person that asks it, what their opinion of what young is, they might have different, consider a different person to be young. So, I'm very, very young. As you quite rightly know, I'm a very young man, and um, but some people might look at me and say I'm old. I mean, they'd be crazy, but they might say that. Um, they also some people might say I'm fit. I'm not, but some people might say I'm fit compared to their own relative fitness, etc. So you want to define these bits a bit more exactly, or put values on them is is a good way of um, of ensuring. That, that you're getting better questions. So if you look at your question, ask yourself, if I handed this to somebody else, would they administer the test or the experiment exactly the same way I would? And how can I ensure that they, that they would? And this comes about through going through the data cycle and maybe going through the results once or twice and realizing that, no, I didn't get quite get the results that I wanted to there. I'm gonna have to go back and ask my question again in a slightly different way to get the results that I want. The second problem can be leading or biased questions. So if you ask somebody a question in a suggestive way or you know put emphasis on certain words that are you know not quite right something like are you overweight? Right? Or you're overweight, aren't you? Something like that. Are you overweight is probably more embarrassing than it is leading. The more only one would be you're overweight, aren't you? It's like enticing uh, an answer for people to go, yeah, yeah, I am actually, yeah, yeah. Would consider myself to be overweight. Now, it's still a vague question because you would define the parameters of what overweight states, but the, the, the leading question is like drawing the positive or the response that you want out of the person that you're asking. So some marketers can skew results if they ask the question in, in, the, quite right, in the right way, or lawyers would ask leading questions so they would lead the witness and this basically this is what I want you to say to support my case. Personal or embarrassing questions are slightly different. Oh, the spelling in there is not very good is it? 
anyway uh, personal embarrassing questions things like what age are you if you ask people what age they are some people won't be embarrassed and especially in questions like that which can be the first part of it like a, a series of questions if you start off with a question that somebody's uncomfortable on and lie about it they're already in the mode of lying about all the answers as they're going along so be careful when asking people personal embarrassing questions something like what age are you you could ask people what category of age they fall into and if you make the spread of ages wide enough people are quite happy to go well i fit in there i fit in there without necessarily you know giving too much away about their about themselves if they want to be a bit more close guarded especially if you're asking strangers and um, they will more likely pick a category and most of the surveys that you see coming through your door will have categories for age and things like that there are other personal embarrassing questions you know weight sometimes marital status things like that can be can be embarrassing or a bit too personal for people to be comfortable answering the last kind of section I'm going to cover is errors and questions so not covering all answers or answers overlapping so if I'm given somebody a age ranges to fall into um, I could you know what age ranges do you fall into Oh, let me just get to the end here. I'll actually type them out rather than write them because as you've probably seen, the writing can be, you know, not great. So if I do under 16 uh, as one category and then 16 to 21 and then 21 to 25, for instance. There's an overlap in those answers. I'll actually put in the next one, 30 to 40, something like that. I mean, there's other problems with this. The um, age ranges are, you know, different sizes and all that kind of stuff but there's answers overlap if you're 21 years of age which cat which one do you take do you take the 16 to 21 or the 21 to 25 so if you get a, a situation like that you want to avoid that you'd want to go 22 to 27 or something like that as your um as your thing so you know the 21 appears in two categories you know, so it, c it can create some confusion. The other bit you can see is that what if you're 26, 27, 28, or 29? There's no option for 26, 27, 28, or 29. Okay. So you want to be careful of those two things. Make sure you cover all options and that you don't have any overlap of categories like 16 to 20 and then 17 to 24 you don't want to create any confusion which is why people will sometimes test their questionnaires and do things like that okay all going great okay different types of data okay still repeat what we did last year uh there are three three sets of these really so the first one we're going to do is um primary and the first what's the difference between primary and secondary data as a recap Oh, this is so exciting. Well, primary data is data that you... If I can find my text box here. Sorry. Uh, there we go. It's that you collect yourself. So, examples would be things like surveys or... Um, looking at ob observational data. So just watching people going about their business. How many people wear yellow jackets, for instance? How many people carry their phones in their pockets? You could observe that in people. Although, you know, lumps in the pocket, you know, you need to be careful about those things. Um, surveys, observations. So anything you, you collect yourself at all um, will fall into that category. You might do stock check and things like that would be other. You could do a stock check yourself. Um, secondary data is stuff that you obtain from somewhere else something like you know there could be or, sorry there are national averages kept of things and uh, you could get results of other service it can even be things like attendances. So attendance is usually recorded by other people. Um, could be, you know, enrollment forms, enrollment data can be secondary data. 
So when you use all in rows, you would have filled out an enrollment form. It can even be things like menus or timetables, things like that. They're all compiled by somebody else, and they're, they're all forms of data. So they're secondary data, if you know what I mean. So any leaflets or pamphlets or things produced by somebody else is secondary data. So well and good. Okay, move on to the next. Discrete and, discrete and continuous. Very often confused with each other, but actually fairly straightforward. Discrete data is counted, and continuous data is measured. Now, the, we, we'll do some exercises in this in class to make sure people don't get confused about it, but an example would be if I was at, we're trying to work out how many males and how many females are in our class. So all I'd have to do is count how many there are. You know, there'd be so many males and so many females. And that's how I would do it. That would be discrete data. Um, if I counted um, the number of times I went to the gym last month, in my case it would be zero, but for other people it might be, you know, a bigger number than zero, and for some people it would be an awful lot bigger than zero, um, but they would be able to count those number of times that that happened. Now, what is measured data? Well, measured data is things like your weight your height, um, temperature, things that are measured on a scale, uh, anything that you can measure. Um, and again, like I said, we'll do some examples of this that will try and confuse you with some of the lines we use. But if you think about exactly what it is you've been asked to count or measure, you know, you'll get whether it's discrete or continuous. Last one, last set is quantitative and qualitative, right? So, I'll start with qualitative, actually. It's usually a word. So, if I, qualitative data is, if I ask you a question, something like, what's your favorite pizza topping? And you would say pepperoni. There's no number in that. Um, nothing to do with that, you'll get an answer. What's your favorite type of dance, you know? Do you like to do line dancing? Do you like to do a bit of a uh, jive? Do you like to do a bit of waltz? Do you like to do a bit of disco dancing? Or are you just, you know, a free spirit dancer? You know, a bit of a pointer with your toes and everything. Um, those kind of things. Anything that has a word as an answer, what's your favorite type of music, will be qualitative data. Quantitative data is your answer will be A number. So it could be said that your quantitative answer will either be discrete or continuous. So sometimes in some of the questions you'll get a question that says, is this data discrete or continuous? Because they're the two forms of quantitative data or qualitative, which is a word. And that's all there is to those different types and sets of data, which is Great. Now, we will do touch briefly on this, but most of this part is coming up in the next video, so how we collect data and represent data. Uh, we usually collect data in a table, like I've said, but more usually it's called the frequency table, and we've used the tally marks and things to count our numbers. They're grouped in fives, and five is called the gate, because it looks like a gate, a five gate. Um, we've talked briefly already, but I'll sum it up again about questionnaires. So a good source of primary data can be questionnaires. Good practice guidelines. We've talked about some of the things to do with regards to questions. Simpler the question, the easier it is to answer. If you give yes, no responses, people can easily identify which one to go with. Give a choice of answers rather than leaving them open, i.e. tick boxes. So if you're asking people how much they spend per month on food, you know, rather than just leaving it totally open-ended, Group your data already. So give not to 50 pounds, 51 to 100, 101 to 150, etc. Give them the tick boxes to fill in. Make sure responses do not overlap or leave gaps that are uncovered and never ask personal questions. People are less likely to answer them. We've covered those bits earlier on in the video. Okay. So that should wrap 
those bits up. We'll do in the next video. I'll start doing some examples of how we collect data and the difference between collecting discrete and continuous data. We'll look at how we represent some um, some of these things by using stem and leaf diagrams, um, scatter diagrams, box and whisker plots, uh, cumulative frequency graphs, etc. We'll start coming on to those. Uh, but until then, this has been a recap of the of last year's work for the most part. And if you have any questions, bring them in the class. Okay. Take care, Peter. Bye.